Everyone at some point in their lives has been insecure. Insecurity is an outstandingly natural and normal feeling, but its impact can be powerful. For most, their insecurities manifest in how they present themselves to the world, whether that be through wearing baggier clothing as to hide their body or changing their hair color in order to fit in. For others, it can lead to body dysmorphia, eating disorders, and plastic surgery. For others still, it can lead to extreme anger and dependency issues, which go on to destroy their lives. Insecurity is seen as a petty, simple emotion, one that most refuse to admit to feeling, but the consequences of it can be deadly. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading. Today, we are going to be covering the murder of Lana Clarkson and the man who killed her, Phil Spector. If you are interested in seeing more of this kind of content, feel free to hit the like button and subscribe. And feel free to share this video as YouTube does restrict true crime videos. With all of that out of the way, let us begin. Phil Spector was born Harvey Philip Spector on December 26, 1939, to his parents, Benjamin and Bertha. In his book, Tearing Down the Wall of Sound, The Rise and Fall of Phil Spector, Mick Brown talked about Phil's early life, how his father unexpectedly took his own life it was not a happy childhood. It wasn't. I mean, when your father blows his head open, you know, it's not funny. And it leaves a scar on you. How his mother then moved him from New York to California, where he never felt like he fit in. And how he was not only bullied in school for his diabetes and asthma, but at home as well by his mother. They ostracized me in high school. They had nothing to do with me. I was not popular. We were poor, but the rest of the school was wealthy, middle-class, white Jewish kids who were very stuck up. But I was not part of the uh, clique. I couldn't have cared less. Um, I made myself popular because I played the guitar and I, I taught the football players how to get A's in certain classes so they could stay on the football team and in return, they would protect me. Were you bullied? Yeah, I was bullied. Physically? Physically, and I got the football players to protect me. I've always had bodyguards. I've always had security. It tends to keep riffraff away. It tends to make a statement that you're isolated, you're protected, and it tends to send a statement out that you prefer to be left alone. Because of his harsh upbringing and his sense of never quite belonging, Phil became somewhat of a recluse. Instead of hanging out with friends after school, going out on the weekends, or spending time with his family, Phil instead walled himself off in his room, listening to music and letting it carry him away from his world. He found solace in sound and became somewhat obsessed with becoming a part of the industry, feeling as if his success would be a sort of comeuppance for the people who doubted him. Revenge and spite were the biggest motivators in Phil's life. After being picked on for everything from his small stature, his weak frame, and his large ears that stuck out promptly, Phil longed for a day when he would be able to walk into any room and have people know who he was. When he saw Elvis perform, he saw how both men and women revered him as a kind of god. He knew that above all, he wanted that for himself, and so he dedicated himself to the art of making music. His first attempt at breaking into the industry came in 1958, when he was just 19 years old. Phil and some classmates from Fairfax High School formed a band named the Teddy Bears, named after the Elvis song. Spectre had also garnered the attention of record producer Stan Ross, who saw the potential in him right away and began to teach him how to produce music, which he was quick to absorb. Shortly after forming the band and learning the ropes from Ross, Spectre wrote and produced the Teddy Bears single, To Know Him Is To Love Him. And we thought the youngsters might uh, like to have a look at the teddy bear. So here they are singing, to know him is to love him. Kids?
title of which was inspired by his father's gravestone. The band had already gotten a record deal with Era Records and had put out other songs, but To Know Him Is To Love Him was the first song that Spectre was fully in control of, and it shot to the top of the charts practically overnight. The song quickly outsold all their other songs and reached the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100 singles on December 1st, 1958. Spectre believed that the success of the song rested solely on his shoulders, as he had written, produced, and worked on every inch of it. Phil, the once timid, shy, and painfully insecure recluse who would spend his weekends locked away in his room, seemed to transform overnight into an egomaniac, convinced that he should be allowed to control every aspect of every record he was on. He was very charming and he was very intelligent. He was incredible with the musicians, but he was also difficult with the musicians. He knew exactly what he wanted. And he was very controlling. He was very manipulative. Era Records and the other producers that the band worked with were quick to push back, understandably feeling like they, the professionals, knew better than he did. But when the Teddy Bears' next singles failed to hit the top 10 of the Billboard charts, Phil felt as if he had been vindicated and that only he had the ability to create music worthy of being number one. After a year of being together, the teddy bears disbanded. Many sources stated this was because Spectre had crippling stage fright, but this rings untrue, as when their other singles and album failed to chart, they were dropped from their label. This surprisingly didn't affect Phil's growing ego, as he felt that the failure was due to the label purposely ignoring his wants and vision. He then formed the band The Spectres Three, which featured himself, Carol Connors, and Marshall Lieb. This band also didn't last long, with only two singles and an album being put out before they too would disband. It was only then when Spectre realized his true passion for music wasn't in being in a band and being at the mercy of record executives, producers, and managers. He wanted to be the one in control and calling the shots because he believed that he was the best and the music he made was better than what was currently being made. He felt passionately that he was the best musical mind in the business and he was not afraid to state that. Spectre began working with and creating some of the top names in the music industry. Spectre's production style, which he called the wall of sound, became famous in its own right, and he quickly became one of the most influential figures in the industry by the age of 21. However, he was horrible to be around. Every person who knew Spectre has since come forward about their experiences with him, and while they will praise his musical ability and the songs he created, they all agree that he was a terrible person, with many stating outright that he lacked any sort of empathy for other people. When he was working as an A&R producer, procuring musical acts for record deals, he often would convince the talent to work under stage names, replacing them with other singers if they crossed him or failed to chart high enough. He refused to give any other artist credit on songs he worked on, feeling as though sharing royalties on a project was beneath him, and in some cases, he would outright refuse to let certain artists perform, which led to multiple careers being completely halted and destroyed. Spectre's behavior on a good day was erratic and explosive. He projected his own insecurities onto everyone around him and felt as if they were constantly undermining his success. Their perceived judgment and incompetence then made it acceptable for him to respond in vitriol, assaulting them verbally and coming close at times to assaulting them physically. As mentioned, Spectre was a man of small stature, standing at a modest 5 foot 5 inches. He had been bullied in his youth for his height, and despite his radical success in his chosen field, in his undeniable fame, Phil remained incredibly insecure about his height, and whenever someone was taller than him and had to physically look down on him while he was speaking, he took it as an insult. Without question, he knew he was physically outmatched, and if a fight were to break out between himself and another able-bodied man, he'd more than likely lose. So Phil started collecting and carrying guns with him at all times, shooting them wildly whenever he was upset. Even in the recording studio, Phil would threaten any person who dared to get in his way, even if the transgression was as small as not singing a note perfectly the first time. Well, uh, working with Phil is very difficult because uh, I guess he's a perfectionist, so he likes to spend a lot of time redoing things and re-listening, and, and it's very time-consuming. It becomes very hard for, I mean, rock and roll's got to be spontaneous and done a little faster. I like um, beauty to be instant, you know, and not to be labored over, and I don't like music to be a hustle. You know, I think we can adequately go into a studio and and do it and not just be frustrated and Phil seemed to be frustrated with us. I think he's frustrated with himself really. He you wasn't um, the most friendly guy I've ever met. He tried to be friends but then he would had a gun on him and he may, wouldn't let me out of his house for a couple days and you know he wouldn't let and then if he said if you want to play his pinball machine 
he'd let you play it for a minute and then he'd say okay everybody to another room and i never met anyone like him and i hope i you know now he's just too difficult to work with and it's too costly and time consuming and uh in the 1980s you know you can't spend i mean uh the opening chord to a song of rock and roll high school he spent 12 hours sitting there listening to that same chord over and over again i mean it's just not worth it then nobody nobody else could hear the difference but the chord came out sounding okay but 12 hours worth ain't really worth it you know you just go crazy you, you would be as crazy as him so we wanted to work with phil because of i mean the guy is a legend and we uh thought it'd be a very good idea to work with a legend and uh you never know when it is be his last project and uh plus we didn't really know how difficult it is to work with the guy before we we stepped into it we found out you know like when when before i wanted to work with him a hundred percent and uh I, w I was going home for the project but he came off differently he seemed more positive and more able and when i got into the studio i found him to be like a helpless little boy or something like a very helpless person he didn't know what to do and that just stifles creativity when you just hang around in agony and frustration and, and stomp your foot and say oh what are we going to do and all you know that doesn't bring out anything in anybody when he would start to lose it there would be glances going back and forth you know brace yourself for it and um then the gunplay started there was a time with John Lennon. There's actually a story that he shot the ceiling. I actually, I was there, I saw it. He shot the um, thermostat off the wall. And uh, John said to him, I don't mind if you're trying to kill me, but I do need my ears. <laughs> so please knock it off. The whole time I was working with him, the gunplay got worse and worse and worse. And at one point, he came up to Leonard Cohen and stuck a gun right in his neck. Phil said to him, don't worry, Leonard, I love you. And Leonard said, I sure as hell hope you do. But Phil's abusive tendencies weren't isolated to his professional life, though. His need to be in control ran deep. And when he met Veronica Bennett, professionally known as Ronnie Spector of the Ronettes, he enacted years of abuse onto her. Phil felt as though he was solely responsible for her success. And thus, she was his property by default. After the two were married in 1968, he purposely tanked her career, forbidding her from performing or making new music. Spectre would keep her imprisoned in their home, which Phil referred to as the castle. He placed a barbed wire fence around the perimeter of the home, kept guard dogs on the property, and went so far as to hide every pair of shoes she owned, so she wouldn't be able to escape or get help. Tell me about the marriage, if you don't mind me asking. Oh, uh, the, the, the marriage was fine at the beginning. Mm. You know, when we were yeah. in New York and making records, you know, we got married. In 68, and I lived in a 23 room mansion, and I couldn't get out of it. That that was bad. I, Why couldn't you get out? Well, the doors were locked from the inside. And if I wanted to go out, I'd have to ask him, you know, can I go outside? Mm -hmm. Then I'd have to ask a security guard, and they would ask Phil, and Phil would say, what do you want to go out for? I said, well, um, uh, ice cream, uh, bananas, uh, you know, I'd make up things to get out. And he'd have them bring it in. So it was a happy marriage. But then eventually things didn't work out. It was a happy marriage for about a year. Yeah. Till I realized I was in a maximum security locker. Front woman Ronnie married the eccentric hit maker, who she says became her tormentor. The gates were up and the barbed wire and uh, I found myself in a prison. I couldn't get out. Ronnie Spector told Inside Edition in 1991 that Spector threatened to take her life. If you leave, I'm going to kill you. He kept a custom-made gold glass top coffin in their basement and often told her that if she ever left him he'd kill her and promptly display her corpse in it and for christmas one year surprised her by adopting two twin five-year-old boys in an attempt to manipulate her into staying with him we were adopted into the family with the intention that we would keep her prolonged into the family we were meant to be shackles for ronnie when bennett would eventually escape running barefoot out of their home and getting help Phil continued to try to control her by stating he would hire a hitman to kill her and make it look like a suicide if she didn't agree to forfeit all future earnings from her songs and surrender custody of their adopted children. Their sons were also not precluded from his horrific abuse, as in 2003, they claimed that he had also imprisoned them in the home. Locked in the rooms for long periods of time, it only let out when Phil wanted to see them. They once told Inside Edition the mansion was like a prison. 
go to school, come back from school, get locked up back in our room again until dinner, come back down, eat dinner, no talking, go back upstairs and locked up. The boys also claimed that when they were let out or visited by their father, he would sexually abuse them. They stated that on multiple occasions, they were blindfolded and forced to perform simulated intercourse with Spectre's girlfriend. Spectre himself allegedly claimed that this was meant to be a learning experience for the boys. Despite how vitriolic and dangerous Phil was to absolutely everyone in his path, he remained one of the biggest names in music, with John Lennon actively seeking him out to work with him on the Beatles' Let It Be album. By this time, it was well known how terrible Phil was to work with, but still, some of the biggest names in music were seeking him out and validating his behavior. And even when Phil pulled out a gun whilst recording, Lennon was able to laugh it off, telling Phil if he was going to shoot near him, he might as well just shoot him, because other Otherwise, he damaged his hearing. For more than half his natural born life, Phil Spector had been allowed to bully, attack, and demoralize everyone he came into contact with. His wives were treated as property, his colleagues were shot at and attacked regularly, and his sons were sexually abused repeatedly. And everyone around him allowed it, thinking that this was just what it cost to work with a genius like him. And no one dared speak up about him or call out what he was doing, lest they suffer even more of his wrath and lose their careers. So it came as no surprise to anyone who knew him that after years of assaults behind the scenes and attempted shootings, that on February 3rd, 2003, Phil finally took a life. Lana Clarkson was everything that Phil was not. Lana was beautiful, vivacious, and no one who knew her had a bad thing to say about her. Lana was the type of girl who easily could have been mean or vapid, and everyone around her would allow for it because of her looks. But she never was, choosing instead to put everyone ahead of herself, and doing what she could to help. Unfortunately, the majority of the reporting around her life and death is centered around the man who killed her, with articles mentioning her as an afterthought. However, her life was much more than that. If you are going to look more into the life of Lana Clarkson, I encourage you not to search Google Images, unless you are prepared to be confronted with images of her dead body, as they are unfortunately one of the first results. Lana was born in Long Beach, California to her parents, Donna and James Clarkson. She was raised with her brother and sister in Sonoma County, California until 1978, where, following her father's untimely death, her mother moved the family to Southern California. While Lana was growing up, she was always told how absolutely stunning she was and how she could be a model, but she always brushed those comments off. She felt as if, if anything, she was pretty for where she lived, but not pretty enough to make it a career. But shortly after the family's move and her being publicly scouted by a small modeling agency, she realized that she could actually thrive in the entertainment industry. She started with modeling, which took her around the world. Despite never booking any large campaigns for designer brands, she was flown to Greece, Japan, Switzerland, and Jamaica for photo shoots where she was the star. It wasn't long until the glamour and fun of living the working model life began to bore Lana, and she wanted more. After speaking with her agent, Lana began to go out for acting roles. She knew that her looks could open doors for her, but she was hoping that she could wow Hollywood with her charisma and talent. Almost immediately, she began to land bit roles in television and film. Most of her film and television appearances were guest roles and bit parts with few speaking lines, but Lana didn't mind. She was determined to work her way up the Hollywood ladder until she got her big break. And in 1983, she finally did, when she was cast in her first Roger Corman movie, Deathstalker. Roger Corman was famous for making B-list horror and science fiction movies, with his latest works being Sharktopus in 2010 and Piranaconda in 2012. He was an incredibly successful movie maker, who focused mainly on making campy movies that weren't meant to be taken seriously. And when he met Lana, he knew he had struck gold. Roger quickly cast her in multiple of his upcoming projects, starting with Deathstalker, where she played a female warrior who was the main love interest in the movie. Directly after that, she was cast as the lead in the film Barbarian Queen, where she was the titular Barbarian Queen. After that, she signed on to be a part of the sequel, Barbarian Queen 2, the Empress Strikes Back, the title clearly parodying The Empire Strikes Back, which had come out seven years before, as well as his movie Vice Girls, where she played a cop working undercover as a stripper. These movies were meant to be cheesy and fun. However, Lana took them incredibly seriously. She wanted to be a real actor who was proud of her work, and she gave her all while on set, even when the movies didn't call for it. Because of that, 
when Lana realized that the Warrior Queen movies had garnered a kind of cult-like audience who loved the movie in a semi-ironic way, she was insulted at first. She wanted her work to be taken seriously, and she felt at times that she was being laughed at. But as the years would progress, Lana would interact with more and more of her fans, realizing that how they enjoyed and appreciated her work didn't matter. What mattered is that they just enjoyed it. She began making promotional appearances at comic book and sci-fi conventions, at times even going the extra mile and dressing in her costume from the Warrior Queen movies. She would sign autographs for hours, talk to every fan she could, and made a point to stay until every last person who wanted to meet her had. At the same time, Lana began volunteering her time at Project Angel Food. This was a charity that delivered food to people suffering with AIDS or HIV during the height of the AIDS epidemic which was seen as something incredibly dangerous to do at the time. There was virtually no research or aid given to people suffering at the time, and because of the lack of solid research given, most people had no idea how AIDS or HIV could spread. Sufferers would be socially ostracized and isolated, so Lana dedicating her time to helping those people just goes to show what an amazing person she was, unlike Spectre, who at this time was getting a custom gold coffin made to terrorize his wife. As Lana entered her 30s, her work opportunities began to dry up. Studios and agents thought she was getting to be too old, and despite her youthful appearance, looked over for jobs that she used to be number one on the call sheet for. But Lana was resourceful. She had been in the industry long enough to know that actresses and models have a harder time getting work after a certain age, and she had a plan. Firstly, she created her own website for her fans, where they could pay to buy memorabilia from her and sign posters and DVDs of her work. Her web website also included a fan message board, where she would be in constant contact with her fans. Because of her frequent appearances at conventions and the huge cult-like following of her movies, she was able to earn quite a bit from this alone. She also decided that she wanted to try her hand at comedy and working as a comedic actress. While Lana realized she could no longer go out and get the young hot girl parts that she had previously gotten, she knew that if she just worked on her comedy skills, she'd be able to bag comedy roles no problem. And so, with the help of some of her friends in the industry, Lana began working on her own stand-up comedy act at various comedy clubs around town. As time continued to pass, Lana realized that she would need to supplement her income, and so she got a job as a hostess at the legendary House of Blues in West Hollywood. The House of Blues served as both a restaurant and a concert venue, and was incredibly popular. It was co-founded by Jim Belushi, and financed by celebrities like Dan Aykroyd, River Phoenix, and the members of Aerosmith. Celebrities were constantly there, enjoying shows or just hanging out, especially at the West Hollywood location. For Lana, the job was perfect. It wasn't incredibly demanding with her choosing to work part-time, but she got the job specifically because it put her in front of people in the industry, specifically the comedy industry. Her goal was to eventually meet some of the comedy legends that she admired, and make such an impression on them that they eventually cast her in one of their upcoming projects. However, Lana would never get the opportunity to flex her comedy skills, or be in any more movies, because on February 2nd, 2003, Phil Spector came into her life. On February 2nd, 2003, Lana started her shift at the House of Blues as she usually did. Lana's job as a hostess was simple. She was to basically ensure that everyone was having a good time and stayed where they were supposed to be. This included her getting people's drinks, seating them, and all around just being a pleasant person. And people really liked Lana. Her long, blonde hair and her sincere smile made her stand out in any room. And people were constantly seeking her out, hoping to get her number, or just to be able to talk with her for a bit. Partway through Lana's shift, Phil Spector and a date came in. This was actually Phil's second date of the night, having previously gotten dinner with another woman who spurned his advances to him and left. As previously established, Phil had quite the inferiority complex that manifested in him having an incredibly pronounced ego. He felt as if stopping and letting any of the hostesses know who he was before making his way over to the VIP, therefore, was beneath him, as everyone who was there should have already known who he was. Phil, along with his date, made their way towards the cordoned-off section hastily, but Lana was quick to stop him, telling him that that area was for VIPs only. 
only and not publicly accessible. Lana had no idea who he was at the time, and seeing he was wearing a long wig, she also thought he was a woman and used feminine identifiers when telling Phil he wasn't allowed in the VIP. This, obviously, set Phil off. This was a man who, at imagined slights, would pull a gun out and shoot around people in order to instill fear. So when this gorgeous, six-foot woman who towered over him called him a woman and said he wasn't important enough to sit in the VIP, he railed into her, calling her every name in the book. He informed her that he was THE Phil Spector, the greatest thing in music, the man behind the greatest songs of all time, and he demanded she apologize at once. And she did. Lana was shaken after this. She had never been spoken to that cruelly in her life, and the fact that it was so public only added to the embarrassment. But she also felt terrible, because in her mind, it was her fault. She was the one who made an error, not Phil. And she, being a people pleaser at heart, set out trying to make things right with him. For the rest of the night, she waited on Phil and his date, hand and foot, apologizing profusely for what she had done and how she had accidentally disrespected him. She was bringing them drinks, comping food, and just going above and beyond to make sure he knew that any slight on her end had been an accident. Phil, being an egomaniac that he was, loved this. Having this stunning model all but grovel at his feet, begging for forgiveness, made Phil feel powerful, and he spent a good portion of his night reveling in the attention that Lana was giving him. At some point, his date decided that she had had enough of Phil's behavior. She felt uncomfortable and unsafe around Phil, especially because he kept trying to force her to drink more. And after a couple hours, she left. And so Phil focused his attention solely on Lana. However, Lana didn't like this. She had gotten this job to make connections in the industry and further her career, and she had attended to Phil that night in order to apologize, but she was in no way seeking a romantic or sexual entanglement with him. Phil began asking her to sit down and drink with him, to take a break and just hang out, but Lana said no. She wasn't really interested and was working, but he didn't let up pressuring her over and over again, telling her that it was okay because he was the Phil Spector and her bosses wouldn't mind if she drank a bit with him. Eventually, seemingly to get him to stop, Lana did drink with him for a bit, but if anything, this made Phil worse. When it was time for her to clock out and go home around 2 a.m., Phil followed her out and began to pester her to go home with him. Everyone who was physically present attested to the fact that Lana rebuffed Phil's advances. It was clear that she was uncomfortable. She didn't want to go anywhere with Phil, but she also didn't want to be rude. Again, this was the Phil Spector. He was a big deal. And having him on her side could lead to opportunities for her. But more importantly, spurning him could be just as impactful on her life, if not more so. Phil had already made it a point to blacklist his exes and try to ruin their careers. And that very night, he threatened to get Lana fired. She knew he could either help her or hurt her. And so, eventually, Lana agreed to go with Phil. Lana got into his limousine, and the two were driven by his chauffeur to his home. From this point on, we don't 100% know what had occurred. We know what Phil Spector stated happened, and what the evidence at the scene tells us. But since Phil died in 2020, and never admitted to his part in the crime, we can never know for sure what occurred when Phil and Lana went to his home. However, we will go over both accounts as to what happened. Come to Mr. I think he killed a lady. Please call me, call me back. I'm going to call the police right now. Thank you. Juan, what are you reporting? Hi, it's, uh, my name is Adriano. I, I think my boss killed somebody. Please, can, can you send me a... a, a Did you think a your boss killed somebody? Yes, sir. Yeah. Because well, I'm a driver, I'm way outside, and I don't know what. Now, why do you believe he may have killed somebody? Because you you have a lady on the, on the floor, and he has a gun on, the, on his hand. Okay, stay on the line. Do not okay. hang up. Did you hear him shoot or anything? Yeah, I heard uh, 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 like a noise, and then he opened the door, and I think he I killed her. According to Phil, when Lana and he entered the home, he took her and gave her the grand tour. After showing her about the house, she then, without provocation, took a gun out from one of his drawers, somehow knowing a gun was in that drawer without him telling her, brought it up to her mouth, and either placed it in her mouth and purposely pulled the trigger, or, according to multiple emails he sent to his colleagues and friends, kissed the barrel of the gun and accidentally shot herself in the face. He then rushed outside, informed his chauffeur of what happened, and urged him to call the police before going back inside, scared and confused as to what had occurred.
from the crime scene, as well as witness testimony from the chauffeur, Lana and Phil went inside the home around 3 a.m. Phil then plied Lana with more alcohol while showing her around the estate, taking her to all the rooms, trying to impress upon her how wealthy he was in an effort to get her to stay. After a short while, Lana tried to leave, and Phil, as he had done previously, flew into a rage. He had, as he had done before, to at least four separate women after nights out drinking just like this one, pulled out a gun and put it to Lana's head, telling her that if she tried to leave, he would shoot her. But unlike those other times, Phil pulled the trigger, killing Lana instantly, at which point Phil wandered around the house, pacing with the gun, drunk and belligerent. They were inside for less than two hours before the chauffeur heard a loud noise, presumably the gunshot, and went to check it out, at which point Phil opened the door carrying a gun with blood on him and said, I think I killed her. Phil then closed the door and walked back inside, leaving the chauffeur outside, confused and concerned that his boss had killed the woman he had talked to mere hours before. After Phil, in his drunken and drug-addled state, told his chauffeur that he believed he had murdered Lana, the chauffeur decided to call the police, but not before trying to call Phil's personal assistant, Michelle Blaine. Michelle was Spectre's right hand, and while he was constantly belligerent and aggressive, she was incredibly business savvy and enterprising, usually putting in the legwork that Phil couldn't. However, Michelle was asleep at the time of the call, and so, without any guidance from his bosses, the chauffeur called the police, stating he believed his boss had killed someone. The cops arrived at the castle quickly and began to discuss how they were going to approach the situation. They knew that Phil had guns, and they were going under the assumption that someone had just been shot. These situations usually call for entire SWAT teams and special units, and the responding police were trying to get their plan of action together when Phil, still drunk, walked out of the home, repeatedly saying, You are not going to believe this. Wait until you see what I did. The police quickly drew their guns on him, not knowing if he was still armed, and they called out for him to put his hands above his head, which Phil did before immediately forgetting, putting them back into his pockets and continuing to walk towards them. They asked him again to stop and put his hands over his head, and he did again before, once again, putting them back in his pockets and walking towards them. They warned him as he continued to approach, telling them that there was a dead woman inside, that if he didn't stop and get his hands out of his pockets, he would be tasered. But Phil didn't listen, and was promptly tasered and handcuffed before the police entered his home. Almost immediately, they found Lana. Her body was slumped over in a chair in one of the first rooms in the home, with a gun on the ground at her feet. By all accounts, it did look like she had shot herself and dropped the gun immediately after. However, nothing about the scene made sense. How did Lana know where the gun was? Why did she choose a gun that had to be taken out of her drawer and not one of the many on display? If she shot herself and Phil had not come into contact with her body after the fact, why was there blood tracked all around the house? And why were there no fingerprints on the gun if it hadn't been wiped down after it was shot? As the cops surveyed the scene, taking pictures and gathering evidence, Phil was seated in the entryway of his home, waiting to be transported to jail for further questioning, and he refused to stop talking. The gun went off accidentally. She works at the House of Blues. It was a mistake. I don't know how it happened, he said. What's wrong with you guys? What are you doing? I didn't mean to shoot her. It was an accident. He then complained about being put in handcuffs, stating that they had tied him up like a pig and that the officers were acting like they were so important and better than he was. As they continued to move around the house, he yelled at them, the LAPD works for me, and spoke about how he was friends with the mayor of Alhambra, and that they had asked him to have Bono sing at an event for him. Even after killing someone, it seemed that Phil still needed to be placated by people and be told that he was a big deal. And why wouldn't he? Up until this point, Phil had assaulted, abused, and terrorized countless people. He had no reason to think that he would be held accountable at this point. Soon enough, Phil was taken back to the jailhouse and properly interviewed and immediately began to besmirk Lana's character and name. He called Lana a cunt for coming over to his house 
just to blow her brains out. He stated she was obviously crazy and that she was ruining his moment with the shit. Mere moments after stating both that he had done this and that she had accidentally killed herself. Almost immediately, the cops knew that Spectre was their killer. It made absolutely no sense for Lana to have killed herself, or for her to even have wanted to kill herself. While Spectre and his lawyers would try to argue that Lana was depressed, having to work a normal job, Lana was actually excited about work. She loved talking to people, and as mentioned, she had a plan. She was working on her stand-up routine, networking with people in the industry, and things were beginning to look up for her. If anything, she was happier than ever. It was clear that the evidence pointed directly to Spectre, but the prosecution wanted to make sure that the case against him was airtight before they went to trial. Because of Spectre's immense wealth, power in the industry, and his high status friends, they wanted to ensure that Lana got justice. It would take a bit over three years for Phil to be brought to trial for her murder. And when he was, it did not go as planned. Spectre, ever vitriolic and ill-tempered, went through three lawyers. The first lawyer he worked with was Robert Shapiro, who famously defended O.J. Simpson. However, they quickly parted ways. The second lawyer he worked with was Bruce Cutler, who went out suddenly in court that he would no longer be representing Spectre because they had a difference of opinion when it came to strategy. By the end of the trial, he was being represented by Linda Kenny Baden, who was also known for representing Casey Anthony. One of the reasons why Spectre had such a hard time holding on to legal representation was, again, for his inferiority complex and his vitriolic narcissism. Phil believed that his lawyers were stupid or at least not as smart as he was, and they were going about defending him all wrong. When his lawyers would hold press conferences in order to get the public on Spectre's side, he would all but sabotage it, interrupting his lawyers and disagreeing with them in front of news cameras. When they would tell him that he had to stay silent, he would argue and claim they were sabotaging him and working with the police. While Phil was in between lawyers during the trial, he decided that he would make a video that, in his mind, would fully exonerate him in the eyes of the public. He asked his assistant, Michelle Blaine, to set up a camera and help him make a video where he told his side of the story. In his video, Phil never once states Lana's name. Instead, purposely dehumanizes her in an effort to distance himself from the crime. He refers to himself as the victim and tries, somehow, to blame the police for what had happened. I'm Phil Spector, and I've been accused of the most heinous crime that one can be accused of, and I'm here to dispel some of the most incredible rumors that have come out about me and the act that took place in my home, which is a castle. The evening in question, when the incident took place and we called for the paramedics, instead of the paramedics showing up, the police showed up and negotiated with me for 45 minutes before they came into the house, but no paramedics came to help the injured party um, who had administered a self-inflicted wound. Uh, then, after about 45 minutes, while the injured party could have possibly been saved from dying because nobody knows what her condition was, alive or dead, the police decided not to enter the house as human beings and to protect and serve, but rather as animals. Uh, drunken animals, if you will, because I don't know that they were not drunk. Because all I know is that they came in barnstorming like storm stormtroopers and overwhelmed me physically about between 12 and 16 of them um, from the Alhambra Police Department and knocked me down, broke my nose, um, gave me two black eyes. Um, cracked my spine, all which received medical attention afterwards, and I have medical documents to back all this up. And when that, they did not feel that was sufficient, they tasered me with 50,000 volts of electricity. And there was a dying woman there 
which we needed medical attention and there were still no paramedics there, yet we called for the paramedics. Did you take Mr. Spector? No. Why? Uh, duh. You know, I mean, that, those are the answers you get. You, 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 uh, you can indict, the district attorney can indict a ham sandwich, only there's more meat in a ham sandwich. The only women who have come forth that have said anything that had to testify under oath were the ones of the grand jury, and they lied. I can prove they lied by simply asking them to take a polygraph test. If they want to take a polygraph test, and the others who have come forth since were not asked to testify under oath. They just made statements to the DA. There's about 10 or 11 of them total. I'll show them how to make money. Here's a check for $100,000. The fingernail from the deceased's thumb, nail, thumb, which is her trigger finger, was capped off because she pulled the trigger with it and it was a false fingernail and it came off. So half of it flew, fell off in the, on the floor and the other, the, both halves split and fell on the floor. Apparently Robert Shapiro said that he had half and the police said they had the other half. Now, Robert Shapiro now says, I don't have the other half because that's obstruction of justice and he can go to jail for that. So he's denied, 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 and then I fired him. I had been out to dinner and um, uh, at the grill. I had been to another restaurant, Dantana's, and then I stopped by the House of Blues close to closing time. And an officer, Bill Spector could never have done this. He could never stand up and shoot a girl in the mouth with a gun. Where's my history of this? How come for the last 40 years you've never heard stories about me pointing gun in women's mouths, blowing their heads open, and, and shooting women? And said, so how come only after this Lana Clarkston incident did all this stuff come out? I've been functioning fine as a human being. To those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Phil Spector. In every famous crime trial, what is the most important thing that one has to have in order to be found guilty of any crime? That is M-O-T-I-V-E. Motive. Now, what her motive was for taking her own life, I don't know, and I really don't care. But it uh, has come time for me to bring out certain circumstances that have been brought to light and have not been brought to light about an incident that happened uh, in my home on February 3rd, 2003. They've made me out to be this heinous, uh, uh, crazy, insane, psychotic person, yet I managed to raise a 22-year-old daughter who's beautiful, who's a straight-A student, and doing just fine, thank you. I have no problems with my life, and yet these people are out to destroy me. Somebody comes to your house, takes their own life, and you're put on trial. And that's the way it's happened, and for two years, Nobody has come to my defense. I've lost my reputation. I've lost all my friends, which were not my friends to begin with. I can't work. Nobody will, uh, nobody asked me for my autograph for the right reasons. Everybody stares at me. I did not have anything to do with her death. She may have accidentally taken her own life. She may have purposely taken her own life. She may have been eating the gun with her dancing. She may have been doing anything. I don't know why, when, how, or where, in what circumstance she may have taken her own life, whether she planned to or not. Throughout the trial, the prosecution focused on Spector's history as a violent and aggressive person, how he had a reputation for carrying guns with him, 
to threaten others and called multiple past partners up to the stand to discuss how he, on separate occasions, had placed a gun to their heads when they had tried to leave him. They touched on the evidentiary support, but delved deep into Spector's life and how something like this was inevitable. The defense, however, chose to try and paint Lana as a woman who had lost it all, who was terribly depressed, and was mixing medications with alcohol in an attempt to drown out her woes. They painted her in a completely false light, stating that years after using her body to get where she wanted in life, that her her inability to get jobs left her feeling washed up and unwanted, that she had been suicidal for weeks, and when she saw the gun at Spectre's home, she made the rash decision to end it all. Surprisingly, despite how the physical evidence existed that showed that Lana would have been unable to shoot herself, wipe the prints off of the gun, and walk around the house before dying, the jury was hung. They were deadlocked. A mistrial was declared, and once again, the prosecution prepared themselves to take Spectre to court, and now fully aware of what tactics the defense was going to use. This time, they focused on the physical evidence on how Spectre allegedly confessed to his own chauffeur, as well as the police, stating everything from it was an accident to she was a dumb cunt who had it coming. But this time, the jury came back, declaring that Spectre was guilty of Lana's murder and sentenced him to 19 years to life in the California state prison system. On January 16th, 2021, Phil Spector died at the age of 81. Most articles discussing his death acknowledge the murder of Lana Clarkson, the abuse of his other romantic partners, and his sons, but they emphasize his musical genius, how he developed the wall of sound in production, and how without him, we wouldn't have some of the greatest music of all time. But his musical talent doesn't negate the fact that he was a monster. No amount of skill makes what he did to Lana or anyone else okay. He was a monster who assaulted his kids, abused everyone he knew, and the world is better off without him. Thank you for watching today's episode of Dreading. If you are interested in more content like this, please subscribe. If you like today's video, hit the like button, and if you have any content that you would like us to cover, please leave that suggestion down below and stay safe.